Welcome to the final part of this week's online lecture. In part 8, we will look at the effect of isotopic substitution. So the question that arises when we consider isotopic substitution is does carbon-13 monoxide rotate the same as carbon-12 monoxide? Well, the one thing that we do know about these two different molecules is that the bond length is the same. I am sure that you have seen a potential energy diagram for a diatomic. Well, you know that the equilibrium bond length can be identified when the potential energy is a minimum. So why would the minimum be the same for these two carbon monoxide molecules? Well, it is because the electronic potential energy surfaces for these two molecules are identical. This is because the electronic potential energy just depends on the interaction between electrons and electrons, electrons and nuclei, and nuclei and nuclei. It depends on the electrostatic interactions between those things. It doesn't depend on the mass of the nuclei. There is no gravitational term involved. It only depends on the electrostatics between the electrons and the nuclei. And the charges on the nuclei don't depend on which isotope you are working with. So the potential energy surfaces of both carbon monoxide molecules are identical. So there is no change in bond length upon isotopic substitution. At least no significant change that we need to worry about. That means that if the bond length stays the same, then the reason why we will see different rotational spectra is because the reduced mass is clearly different. The reduced mass won't be the same, and so the rotational constant will be different, and so the spacing between the lines will be different. So if this is the spectrum of carbon-12 monoxide, my spectrum for carbon-13 monoxide will be different. In fact, the lines will be slightly closer together, and the reason why is the reduced mass for carbon-13 monoxide is larger. If the reduced mass goes up, the moment of inertia has increased. If the moment of inertia has increased, and because it is inversely proportional to the rotational constant, it means that the rotational constant decreases. And if the rotational constant decreases, then the spacing between my lines decreases, because the spacing is equal to twice the rotational constant. And so the lines for carbon-13 monoxide are at slightly lower frequencies than they are for the corresponding lines in carbon-12 monoxide. For the carbon-12 monoxide, the rotational constant is equal to 1.92 wave numbers. And for carbon-13 monoxide, it is equal to 1.84 wave numbers. There are quite a number of interesting things that can be done with this. The intensities will depend on the number of molecules that are in that rotational level. Well, the number of molecules will be proportional to its abundance in nature. So if I look at the carbon-13 monoxide spectrum and compare it to the carbon-12 monoxide spectrum, the ratio of the intensities is proportional to the ratio of their abundances in nature, so I can use it to determine the natural abundances of isotopes. The other thing that I can do is accurately determine atomic weights. Because my moment of inertia is proportional to my reduced mass, and my reduced mass is inversely proportional to my rotational constant, the ratio of the rotational constant of carbon-12 to carbon-13 monoxides is equal to the ratio of my reduced masses of carbon-13 to carbon-12 monoxides. And if I measure these two rotational constants, I come up with 1.046. And I know the atomic weight of carbon-12 is exactly 12 by definition, so therefore I can determine the atomic weight of carbon-13. And in fact, this was done in 1950, where they used microwave studies to determine the atomic weight of carbon-13, and they found it to be 13.0007. This is a very good method to determine the accurate weights of isotopes. This is the end of my online lecture for this week.